Welcome to the Smart Tech Check Podcast, hosted by Mark Vina, your home for candid, insightful, and provocative conversations about the smart home, home automation, security, smartphones, PC and console gaming, and much more. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Vina, host of the Smart Tech Check Podcast. Today is Friday, April 8th, 2022. Uh, today is uh, opening day for baseball, so one of our first topics is going to be talking about the impact of technology on uh, baseball. But before we get into that, let me introduce today's trio of tech fantastic journalists, the dynamic trio that's Stuart Walpin, who writes for Popular Mechanics, U.S. News, Techlicious, Investopedia, and other fine publications. Rob Peguero, a Washington Nationals fan, by the way, who writes frequently for Tech Policy <laughs> <laughs> for Wirecutter, PC Mag, and uh, USA Today, and John Quinn, who ca- could care less about baseball. <laughs> the right, the New York Times, Smart Cities, and Tom's Guide. Don't hold that against them. Uh, gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm doing this podcast, even though the game, the Yankee game, has, is going to start in a few moments. But uh, I want to welcome you to the podcast. And how are you guys? And how any big plans for the weekend before we get into things? Play ball. <sighs> yeah, that and mowing the lawn. <laughs> Formula One, Formula That's One. For Rob, do you have one of those smart, uh, smart uh, uh, grass cutters? You know, they're like it's like a no. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here to testify to the the joys of the corded electric lawnmower. If you have a small enough lot, I've had this thing since we bought the house in 2004, and the only maintenance it's needed since then is sharpening the blades. I've even managed to avoid running over the extension cord with the mower. Wish me luck. <laughs> Yeah, Tomorrow I imagine Sunday that, that would be not this. a good experience if you ran over the extension cord with a... Um, Keeps me on my toes. That would keep you on your toes. But let's let's jump into the first topic uh, here. Uh, there we go. And, you know, I kind of teased this at the beginning. Um, you know, that we, we could go on for hours about this. You know, Stuart, uh, Rob, I'm John, even though you're not a big crazy baseball not fan, so I'm sure you'll have, some, you'll have yeah. some opinions on this. But you know what's so unbelievable how baseball has changed. I mean, the analytics has changed, obviously, in a much dramatic way, but you know, the, the in-person experience at the game itself has changed. Uh, the, uh, you know, with the uh, MLB app, uh, Rob, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the um, experience in terms of buying tickets in the old days, you know, when I say the old days, you had to go to the stadium and actually get tickets, or even if you could buy tickets at Ticketron. Remember Ticketron? I don't know if, they still, yes. if they're still yes. still around. Uh, but, you know, the problem with Ticketron, of course, they had a lot of tickets, you know, a certain lot size of tickets. And if you wanted to get really good seats, that was not always a good option. You had to drive into the Bronx if you were a Yankee fan or at the Shea Stadium, <laughs> if you were Stuart Walpin. Uh, but, you know, so many aspects of the game has changed. And I want to just talk a little bit about that because it is, you know, opening day. And let me start that with our resident baseball historian, Stuart Walpin, on your quick two cents on that topic. Well, I don't think it's shocking that baseball has changed because baseball has been a, has has stays the same and it changes all the time. And I, the the biggest changes in technology aren't necessarily on the field, but how we see the game. Um, back back in the day, there was a hue and cry amongst the owners not to allow radio because they thought it would detract from live attendance. And when they realized that it boosted live attendance, they became all in. And then that process repeated itself when television came into being threatening radio in the early 50s and then you had pay cable coming in which walter o'malley the cursed walter o'malley that's a whole other story uh, started doing pay cable for the dodgers back in the late 50s uh, it became much more commonplace in in the 80s and 90s and then you had of course the teams then all of a sudden taking games off television and putting them on their own little um, pay cable networks. And now you have streaming. Apple TV is going to be streaming games now tonight. I'm going to have to watch tonight's Nats game as will Rob on Apple TV. Peacock bought some games. So this is a continuing evolution of how we consume the sport. Um, One of the more on the field aspects that I thought was interesting, which I which they talked about last night. Rob, you were at the game, so you wouldn't have probably heard that. But apparently the Mets were supposed to use this new pitch comm system. Oh, the thing where the catcher is tapping out. Correct. They have nine buttons on their on their on their arm, and the pitcher has some sort of speaker or something in their in their under their hat. And, and so the catcher, a pattern. 
buses or patterns or something, but I guess they decided not to use it. And you saw both teams use the old fashioned putting down the fingers. And what was the indicator? One's a fastball, two's a curveball. You curve can ball. thank the Houston Astros for that. <laughs> right. yeah. That's exactly right. But apparently, I'm neither team. Trash man's getting banged. <laughs> Apparently, both teams had access to this pitch comp system. Neither one of them used it. But uh, for the in-stadium uh, experience, I think Rob can talk to that since he was actually at a game last night. My first game is until next week. Uh, so, no, actually, no, that no. wasn't that much of a difference, except that, um, you know, it was a home opener that was supposed to start 4.05 in the afternoon, got pushed back to 7, and then delayed further to 8.20 because of crummy weather. Uh, it was a smaller than... Definitely not everyone who bought a ticket showed up, which I get it. Uh, but even so, the concessions were backed up. So that was a case where technology had not made a difference. Like, we're actually used to that. Opening day jitters, there's some new vendors who don't know what it's like to have a bunch of people lined up, you know, on the center field concourse who would like to get their sandwich now and not an inning and a half later. So uh, the ballpark app that MLB has, it's sort of good, but there were other cases where for a while it wasn't working. And, of course, it can't tell you that, oh, this particular vendor has uh, run out of bread, so your steak sandwich will be more like slices of steak and fries. Oops. <laughs> uh, yeah, otherwise, you know, kind of the same experience. They, um, yeah. Rob, yeah. Rob you, don't, you don't think that's part of a More technologically advanced. Rob, you don't think that's part of a conspiracy theory that when there's a, when, when there's a rain delay, the, the home team likes that because they can sell more um, concessions? <laughs> Well, no, because you, you want to have, you know, you, you should make sure you have, I mean, there were lots of concession stands that were actually not occupied. Like our seats were in uh, section 306 and yeah, this one big beer stand at one end of the left field stands, just vacant. Nobody had showed up there. They weren't running it. So if, if they were trying to get people to spend more money, they should have given us more chances to do that. So let me pull John into this in, in terms of the, the topic that Stuart raised, and that is right. around the – there's so many different ways to watch baseball, which at a high level sounds great, but the, the discovery of content, and it's all, almost like a Byzantine-like labyrinth that you have to navigate. Well, where can I watch? You know, now you've got Apple, you've got Peacock, you've got most of the, the, the big – the teams in the major markets have um, their own networks. Like in Boston, they've got Nesson. In uh, New York, they've got uh, the uh, – Yes, work for yes. the uh, yeah. for the Yankees. I mean, that's not a, John. That's not really a pleasant experience for a user. And right. and you could apply this, by the way, to other content as well, movies and and, and other you know um, entertainment type of conflict. But you know, give me your two cents on how that could potentially be kind of a bad thing in terms of just it's so complex just to watch your your favorite team. Well, it, I mean, one of the things that is complex is say so you're going to lose people. But even if it weren't, even if it was an easy, even if I had a, a series of buttons on my Roku box and just went click, 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 it's still going to fragment the audience. So that means mm -hmm. you're going to lose some viewers somewhere along the line. And some of us are going to decide, you know what, I don't need to see every game or, you know, my my partner is already yelling at me for watching too many of these things anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll, I'll just drop one of these services. Uh, yeah, no, no, <laughs> I'm sure she's fine with it anyway. <laughs> um, so obviously, you know, that, that definitely fragmenting it uh, loses some of the audience, you know, look, I'm a formula one fan and formula one now in the United States at any rate is just, it's on ESPN, the race start to finish no commercials, no interruptions. Excellent. You know, that that's that's my that's perfect for me. And I don't have to figure out when it's on because it's on whatever time it's live in whatever part of the world. So actually, it'll be in Australia. So it'll be the middle of the night. But, you know, so I'll, I'll stay up a little late and watch it. Um, but, yeah, you're absolutely right. When you fragment it like that and make it complicated, you're going to lose some audience. But Maybe overall, the content provider, the team makes more money, though. Well, the, mo the money that um, that the Yankees, for example, generate with the, the Yes Network is beyond belief. I mean, right. I'm all the major, right. it's the same is true in L.A. and the same is true in, in, in Boston. So, you know, and th th you know, this is one of the, the things that's happened with baseball over the last 40 years is that monetization factor, which, you know, it was always kind of, you know, like people – who have this romantic view of baseball says, so, well, you know, that, that only happened 25 years ago. And that's not, that's not really true. I mean, Stuart, in baseball has always had a financial motive. Um, it's always been a business. Now, maybe the players didn't, were not able to 
exact their pound of flesh for their services. And I think right. that's largely been resolved over the last um, 30 years or so. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I, you know, the one thing that I think is going to be interesting about baseball, then we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the, the, the next topic. It's what's going to happen when uh, gambling really starts to get deployed in, in a large way. For example, there's a bill in uh, California. Finally, you know, California has been one of the holdout states in terms of really, you know, uh, not just legalizing gambling because it's now uh, you, it can be executed at, at a statewide level. But they obviously, the state of California obviously wants to get their piece of the action. But once you get into this thing where, you know, from the comfort of my couch, which you can already do from some states, I can use my DraftKings or um, or some other betting application online. Hey, I want to put fifty dollars down on the Yankees, or I want to, and I, that to me is going to be it's going to rechange. It's going to change the shape of the game when all of a sudden you have you know one hundred and fifty million people doing this every single day. You know, and there will be people who do that. So I think uh, that's going to have an impact. And we could probably do a so we'll probably, we could probably do a podcast just on that topic alone. But let me bring up the next topic uh, that I'm sure you guys will have an opinion on. And that is, you know, the big news this week was uh, good old Elon Musk, who uh, John hangs out on a very regular basis. Um, <laughs> you know, he bought 9.2% um, in Twitter. Uh, he's now on the board at Twitter. He has some very, uh, uh, you know, very public views on some of the shortcomings of Twitter. I'm saying that uh, somewhat uh, uh, diplomatically. But let me start out with Rob. Rob, what's your two cents? I mean, do you think it's going to move the need- it's going to move the needle from a governance standpoint in terms of the way Twitter conducts itself? I mean, it's certainly that's what so Elon Musk intends. It will make for immense awkwardness the next time Elon Musk does something stupid on Twitter. Which five minutes? Um, <laughs> he's got no inner monologue there. Uh, on the other hand, you know, he is clearly one of the smarter, more capable people around in the entire world of technology. The piece I'm working on right now is how I, I looked up old quotes that people in like the Senate offered about SpaceX in 2010. They've aged really, really badly because uh, no one really, you know, saw what a good, good organization Musk could put in place there. So I don't know. Uh, there was a good post I read in the Washington Post this morning that noted that like, what is Elon Musk complained about a lot on Twitter, about Twitter, all the crypto spam bots, which, yeah, if, if he can push them to get rid of the cryptocurrency spammers. I had one occasion where uh, I had some tweet I'd retweeted from South by Southwest where somebody involved in the cryptocurrency world was mentioned in it. And then there were like 300 people retweeting it, offering some link to one sketchy site or another. I'm like, do you people get a life to, to evoke <laughs> William Shatner and on Saturday Night Live? Um so, yeah, I don't think he is that serious of a student of social media, because if you're going to say free speech, no matter what, no, that's never worked. Going back to Usenet, if you have no way to kick off the griefers, the Nazis, the spammers, the bigots, the trolls, the whole network just sinks under its own weight. Somebody's got to be the bouncer. Somebody's got to kick people off or delete posts. Uh, otherwise, at a minimum... An ad-supported social network will never work because advertisers don't actually like being around Nazis if they can help it. And so I don't know how much Elon Musk can do there. But, you know, who knows? He comes up with crazy ideas that work sometimes. So maybe he's going to have some value add that I don't see coming myself. But, but John, don't you think that Musk does have a point in terms of you know, just try, you know, trying to separate false information from non-false information. And yes, you know, Twitter is a private company. They can do whatever they want. You know, they can have any, any rules they want to implement. But Twitter has, you know, gotten a couple, more than a couple of black eyes over the last uh, a few years in terms of being wrong about certain topics. So, and I, and I think that if all of a sudden, if the Twitter um, user uh, or the person who likes to, you know, uh, to watch all the various tweets that come out of their Twitter feed, if they start to feel that they're not seeing everything on a transparent basis, doesn't that dilute the um, the Twitter brand in some ways? Or, John, what's your what's your two cents? I mean, originally that old, you know, South by Southwest introduction of it by uh, Ashton Kushner and those guys, right? Was this was just kind of like eh, 140 characters, whatever. Um, but pot calling the kettle black. Oh my gosh, right? One of the biggest sources of misinformation on the internet is Elon Musk. 
you know, uh, just one thing after another, including this, including this violation of SCC rules. You're supposed to declare when you amass a certain number of shares. What was he doing? Yep. He was driving the price of the stock down by saying that he was going to open up perhaps a competitor to the uh, Twitter and ha have his own Elon Musk and then Trump's truth. And then we'll have these weird, you know, social networks. Yeah. If this doesn't get him in trouble. Oh, my gosh. Come on. There are no rules. Uh, but, you know, as far as him, you know, there's misinformation totally bogus. I mean, he's putting misinformation out there all the time, you know, um, his autonomous vehicles, his Teslas that have the self-driving function, not a chance, not a chance. <laughs> right. But um, so I think it's pretty outrageous. Uh, he doesn't have any expertise in this area. Um, he doesn't have any particular knowledge, you know, going back maybe you know, PayPal days. That was a long time ago. Uh, but and, and for, you know, he's done great at organizing things as SpaceX. Perfect about hiring the right people. That was all about hiring people who knew what they're doing and uh, pushing the EV market. Absolutely. But yeah, I think this is a disaster <laughs> waiting to happen. That's mm -hmm. what I think. <laughs> so let me let you have, have the last word only because, you know, what, what John, and he kind of hinted at it with, with SpaceX, at least, you know, if he does get indicted for something, he has a exit plan. He'll get one on one of his rocket ships and, leave the planet. But, um, so what's your take on that balance between well, free speech and... At the end of the day, Elon Musk is a capitalist. I mean, talking about what uh, John mentioned about his little trying to drive the stock down, he made $156 million doing that. That was the figure I saw cited. Um, but at the end of the day, he's a capitalist. He wants to make money. I mean, SpaceX was not started as an altruistic venture. And John is right. He hired the right people to do it. So I'm not going to say that I'm sure that he's going to do that here because he has a, a, it's a different kind of animal. But one of the things that did frighten me about this entire thing was that apparently when he first started buying in, he bought on it. And I don't I don't know exactly what the technical term is. It was 13 B or C or something. I don't remember what the term passive is. Passive investor. Passive investor. Exactly right. He bought yeah. in as a passive investor. And then a few days after it was announced that he had bought larger than a 5% stake, which you have to do by law, he changed it to an active investor. Now, the fact that he did that and it flew somewhat under the radar, unless you were paying attention, I don't know what it means, but it means something. The fact that he he had to actively do that to change from a passive to an active investor. And the fact that he owns less ten, than 10 percent, that the other four major uh, investors are all institutions. They're not individuals. So whether or not they want to get in his way or not, or even can get in his way, I don't know who else is on the Twitter board. But and those mad those top five I think own thirty seven percent of the so how much control he's actually going to able be able to exert with those active shares? I, I, again, he's a capitalist. He's going to do what he wants to do to make money. I agree, and more than he will make he'll, he'll figure out a way to you know whether it's. I mean, I don't think he has plans on becoming the majority uh, a shareholder at. Um, uh, a Twitter. I, I, again, I, I, you know, and, and, and I, I will say one thing too. And, and John does raise a, a, a good question in terms of, you know, there are p business leaders. And John, you know this that this happens all the time on Wall Street. That you know that people who um, want to buy a company or take out a significant state, they ha they do have some type of public voice. They talk the stock down. They talk the stock down, yeah. and it allows them to, you know, then come in at the last minute. Oh, well, by the way, I, I'm, I was just kidding and. You know, now I can you know, spend two hundred million dollars less than I had to spend before. You know, to, to right. buy this stock. So that, that's to me, it's an SEC matter. And if 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 there is obviously is an issue about that, you know, Elon Musk should be taken to task uh, about that. You know, I, I I do think though there is a reckoning coming for Twitter. I, I you know, it, it, Elon Musk or non Elon Musk. I mean, there there are still significant um, I think uh, credibility gaps are now that that um, that the, the brand is really suffering from. You know, and I just don't, you know, that they, they it was kind of perceived as this kind of, you know, digital town um, town hall where every, anybody and everybody could share their voice. And I just get very nervous when, you know, a company puts itself in a position on deciding, you know, here, here are the people we feel 
uh, the, the resources we feel are credible from an information standpoint, and here are the resources, here are the sources of information we think that are not credible. I, I get the very, very antsy about that, you know, but that, that's what competition is all about. Let us hit the next topic here, which is going to be a fun one to talk about. That is, you know, and it's not obviously fact yet, but, you know, where there's, there's probably smoke, there's probably some fire here. You know, Apple apparently, you know, is trying to join the party with a lot of other companies and developing an actual iPhone subscription service where you would pay some monthly fee, you know, uh, of who knows, $40, $50, $25 a month forever. <laughs> and you would be guaranteed a new phone every time, every time Apple comes out with a brand new phone. Now, um, it, it, you know, there's a lot, and I, I don't want to turn this into a financial review call, but, you know, if you essentially flip their business model from a purchase model to a, le a essentially a leasing model, it, it, it really has some enormous implications. So that's, I, that's outside the scope of the conversation I want to have with you guys. But let, do you think, you know, with all the subscription fatigue that people have, you know, with, with Netflix, with Hulu, now this is yet one more service that hey, I got to pay 25 bucks a month for or whatever Apple comes up with. So do you really think that there is appeal for this? And let me start with Stuart on that. Well, it, this is obviously would be a money maker for Apple um, because it, it, from the numbers I see, the the um, the average iPhone owner holds onto their phone for three years. And if they pay it off in two years, that means they get a essentially they get free use of a phone for a year by right. putting it on a subscription network. You would be constantly paying. Um, now, what, the, the only way that this works from a purely financial point of view for the consumer is that if it's lower than the monthly payments they would already be making on their 24 or 36 month plan. Now, on the other side of this, there's an ecological side to this. Right now, the numbers that I saw was that only about 20 percent of phones are recycled and Apple has been quite active in trying to use recycled materials in their phone. And one of the positive aspects of this is that they would be able to get all their phones back. And so when you're talking about a billion, more than a billion new phones are sold every year, which means that 800 million phones are ending, ending up in landfills or, or whatever, the fact that the seller of about a third of the number of phones sold would be able to get all those phones back for recycling is not insignificant but i think this only works as if if apple can offer a lower monthly fee that consumers are already paying on their 24 or 36 month payment plan well and and there is going to be a bit of complexity for this because whatever and they could have various levels of um subscription fees like if you want the best and greatest phone you'll pay a higher subscription fee than you would for maybe a mid-level phone or whatever. And, right, and right now i think the highest fees are around 45 to 50 dollars a month for the uh, for the pro max versions of the phone if you have a 24 month plan so the apple plan would have to come in under because if, if somebody's holding on to their phone they're holding it on holding on to it for a reason because they don't right. think they need a new one their phone is just mine and why should i have to pay money to get exactly the same thing that i had before in their eyes well and this might be and let, let me flip this over to john this might be a recognition by apple that going forward, because they really have one of the few American companies that look forward, you know, to five, 10, 15 years in, in the future uh, from a um, an economic standpoint, in terms of the way their business model operates. And if they believe that over the next three to five years, it's going to be more and more difficult to convince people to buy the latest phone and spend 12, 13. $1,400, they have to come up with some other mechanism to encourage people to do it at a perceived lower cost, you know? So John, what, 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 what is your, what is your take on th this whole rumor mill around this topic? Well, I think it's definitely something they're exploring and something, you know, the floating the trial balloon, so to speak. And as Stuart said, it would make an awful lot of money for Apple. There's no question yeah. about it. And it gives you the opportunity to, to continually increase your fees because there are other services. And gee, don't you want that other service as well? It's only $2 more a month. Uh, and it also gives you more control over the phone, which they've had rulings go against them in terms of what you can do with your phone and that device. If you were leasing it, it's much more restrictive. Think of a car that you lease. You can't drive it very far. You know, there are all sorts of different restrictions on that leased car if you want to get your money back. Uh, so uh, definitely gives them more control. But I, I think to your point, the smartphone is kind of dead. I mean, there hasn't been an interesting development in smartphones in, I don't know, eight years. That's been a long time. 
right? A new camera is not really great. And having a thumb right and facial recognition, they're all pretty minor things. That form factor stayed the same. But if you think, okay, now it's a commodity and it's really not going to change in the next few years, then why not start treating it that way until whatever new device, whatever replacement comes along for that. And I think that's that sort of futuristic science fiction, what's going to come along and replace the smartphone, but something is going to replace the smartphone. And I think you're right, Mark, that it is kind of a commodity. And so, you know, put a Hasselblad camera on one of them. That's cool, but it's really not. That's what know. OnePlus is doing. Yeah, that's why I love the OnePlus. That's, you know, that's my phone these days. But um, I have well, to and, say. And, and, and you know, these fun. subscription services, that many of them, you know, of course, it depends on what the cost is per month, but are incredibly sticky that once you get on, get, get them, you know, it's very, very, you know, it's, there are churn rates. I don't want to, I don't want to dismiss the, 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 um, the importance of churn rates, but in terms of once you get somebody on board, if you have a compelling offer, you know, that person tends to stay in that, in that program for a long, long period of time. And, uh, you know, from an, it becomes an annuity that revenue is becoming an annuity on a monthly basis for, um, for Apple. Rob, Rob all what's your data. Yes. All that data too. So you've got all that data, you know, as, you guys well know I was switching phones all the time, which is what we do to test all these phones. Every time I've got hundreds and hundreds of apps and I mirror them and I do as much as I can, but it's still really painful to switch phones. Right. So they really, they, they would have you if they had you on that subscription, boy, they would have you. So Rob, let's hear from you before we uh, get off the podcast so I can watch the, uh, the, the Yankee game. Uh, 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 Red Sox three, Yankees two, three, by the way. Three, Yank, right, three to two Red Sox. <laughs> You had it coming. Thank you for staying for Cole. I'm just going to stop. Uh, so I've seen these Apple subscription rumors, but don't they already have the iPhone upgrade program? What does this actually do that's different? And and the other thing well, is most they people have, they have, they have no good reason to buy it to get a new phone every even every two years. I mean, right. they're incremental products. If there were huge changes that in a new iPhone that made an old one obsolete, Apple wouldn't keep selling the old models at a hundred dollars cheaper for each year. They've been, they've been around. Right. So yeah, I would be very, very leery of taking this. Um, and certainly if it's something that's done through carriers where then it's another way for the carriers to sort of bind you to them as they used to do with contracts. So I don't know that this is solving a problem that people have as opposed to, uh, you know, Apple C suite might have because they, they don't have enough, piles of cash to drive into like Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, only you can compare uh, Tim Cook to Scrooge McDuck. Uh, Someone needs to make <laughs> that happen. At least Tim Cook wears pants. <laughs> that's true. Right. right. That's, uh, that's true. Well, I mean, the only thing I'll put to wrap a bow around this, is it's really going to depend on what the offer numbers look like. Um, I mean, there is a complexity level that, you know, I think that we all agree that, it's is not it's not going to be a one you know one size fits all type of uh, program i think to your point rob there is a carrier component to this that might hey you know this might keep the carriers a lot more interested because you know that now this gives them a bit of a uh, a revenue p component because they'll get a piece of that monthly um that monthly subscription fee as well so it'll be interesting to see the way they roll that out and by the way i'll just end it this way too i don't know if they'll confine it purely to phones i mean they could they can extend this to tablets they can, can uh, extend this to um, laptops. Hey, you know, spend four hundred dollars a month with us, and we'll give you a new phone, a new laptop, and a new uh, a new uh, iPad every uh, every uh, year and a half. You know, right. so you know, all of a sudden now, you know, your Apple relationship becomes a lot more tighter. You know, because you're paying them a whole lot of money on a, on a monthly um, a monthly basis here. But let me uh, sum up the podcast here and get us to opening day here because I have to run. Uh, guys, thanks for taking the time to join me for today's podcast. For our viewing and listening audience, thanks for making the Smart Tech Check podcast part of your day or commute. Please make sure that you hit the like and subscribe buttons at the end of today's podcast. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Mark Vina, at, at Mark Vina Tech God. If you haven't already, please make a donation to the Red Cross or your preferred charitable organization to help the brave people of Ukraine in their time of need. And until next time, guys, have a great weekend. You too. Take care. Mm -hmm.